if the house is already on fire, maybe it's too late to run for the door. And so it's important to have that plan B in place today and not be scrambling when, when the house is already burning down. The United States Federal Election Commission looked into prosecuting me for being a foreigner interfering in American elections because I was donating this guy some money for years. Yeah. And people ask me all the time, what do you think of Trump? What do you think of Biden? What do you think of this, that? And I think I'm glad it's not my problem anymore. From Nomad Capitalist Live 2023, where we've got every room in the house, I'm happy to be joined by Roger Ver. He's known as Bitcoin Jesus. He was known as really, I think, the, the OG of U.S. citizenship renunciation sparked a trend. Roger, uh, good to have you in Kuala Lumpur. Where are you spending your time these days? I think a lot of people follow you. You're in the Caribbean. You're in East Asia. Where does the, uh, the OG of uh, freedom seeking go? Yeah, uh, it's a little bit of a difficult question to answer, but I think one of my friends summed up very well when he said that I'm basically high-class homeless. Yeah. And I, I thought that was a pretty accurate description, although I do have a number of homes around the world. But uh, most recently, I've been spending my time between the Caribbean, uh, Japan, and uh, South Korea. And why those places? They're all wonderful places, but very different. So uh, Korea yeah. and Japan are cold in the wintertime, so that makes the Caribbean much more attractive in the winter. And then in you know, the summer and fall, like the, the weather is wonderful in both Japan and Korea. And the, I love the food. I love the culture. I uh, speak fluent Japanese and I'm working hard on my Korean at this point. That's coming along. And it's just a, a fun place to experience new things that are so different from the U.S. and other places where I, I grew up. And so you're living a form of what we talked about, the trifecta. My lifestyle trifecta idea was I like different cultures and it's hard to choose. There's so many great places. Let me get in a slice of each. Are you leaning in one way or the other right now? Are you more focused on developed Asia? Or are you more focused on the Caribbean, where I know you're trying to get uh, greater Bitcoin cash adoption? Where's the, the focus, if anything, and what drives that? Yeah, I think uh, you said it best. Go where you're treated best. And so, like, I've uh, hopped around the world quite a few places. I used to really love my time in Japan. And during COVID, they made it so difficult to do anything going in and out of the country there. And it kind of left a, bad, uh, a bit of a bad taste in my mouth in regards to the government policies of Japan. And so I've been spending a lot less time in Japan because of that recently. But uh, you know, it's a constantly evolving world, so you got to, you know, go with the flow and go where you're treated best as that goes. And uh, here we are. I'm having a great time in uh, Malaysia with you this week. And you, you, you are building the property portfolio, which I think if you're having a plan B is, is essential. What are your tips for creating a global property portfolio? Yeah, I think a good tip is if you're going to go the citizenship by investment route via real estate, don't just buy the bare minimum. Buy a place that you would actually like and want to, to stay at. Uh, and so, like, for example, uh, I've done that in a couple of different countries at this point, and I bought places that I would actually like to go and stay and spend time at, and I do because I enjoy those places now. Not only in the Caribbean citizenship by investment, because most of those programs, St. Kitts perhaps exempted, you're not gonna you're gonna get a timeshare basically if you don't spend more. Yeah, if you if you don't spend more, you get you know a, a glorified cardboard box basically. Yeah, it's a two weeks or whatever. So you can buy some nice villas in like a St. Kitts or Grenada. You could actually spend, if you spend a couple million. I made that mistake, and I mentioned that on stage last night, let's say in Colombia, where what's the minimum? Well, I don't want to do more than the minimum. And then you're like, eh, I kind of like coming here, but I don't really like staying in this place. And, and I'd like to give a, a special, I guess, uh, endorsement of St. Kitts. That is a beautiful, gorgeous island. I don't have to spend a single day there. I spend a lot of time there because I love it there. It's such a beautiful, wonderful place. And I've invited other people that have St. Kitts citizenship by investment to say, hey, why don't you come to St. Kitts? And they they often reply, but people actually go there and have to explain to me, yes, and it's absolutely gorgeous. If you go on YouTube and search St. Kitts drone videos, you'll see some just amazing, amazing. It's one of the most beautiful islands I've ever been to in my life. You said you like the southern part of St. Kitts is your favorite. The southern peninsula is where a lot of the expats are from a place called Frigate Bay and then farther south from there is really a wonder. And the whole island's wonderful, but that's where most of the, the expats uh, are. It was an interesting question that was pro uh, proposed during the pandemic, which is, what if everyone who had, let's say, St. Kitts citizenship, which is by investment more than the people who actually live on the island, what if they all got fed up with the COVID policies where they lived and said, screw it, I'm going to my second citizenship? Obviously, that would be a little bit tougher, but perhaps a reason why you want to do as you and I do and just have a place ready to go so that you're not scrambling if you're in a place like Japan where it's tough. Yeah, it's good to have a plan B, but it's even better if you have a plan C, D, E, and F. All the way to, to Z. Let's talk about where I first come across you, uh, you gave up U.S. citizenship. Obviously, some celebrities had done that. Tina Turner recently passed away. She had given it up. Eduardo Saverin, not far from us in Singapore, he gave it up, one of the founders of Facebook. And, and he actually kind of, I found it offensive. He wasn't even born in the U.S. And they took it as a great offense and tried to pass laws and really get the guy in trouble. When did you know 
I don't want to be a U.S. citizen anymore. Because you left a long time before you renounced. Yeah, so I, I looked into renouncing uh, a long, long time ago. And so to answer your question, when did I want to renounce? The moment I got into trouble in the U.S. for political speech. And so I wound up going to jail for selling firecrackers. But the real reason were some political comments I made about not being happy with the U.S. government. And the moment that happened, I realized, wait a minute, this whole freedom of speech thing in the U.S., it's not really true. You're free to say anything as long as it doesn't offend the wrong people. And the moment you offend the wrong people in political power, you better watch out. And I'm really concerned for Elon Musk at this point. Like, I love what he's doing, but wow, he better watch out. He's playing with fire there. Are you suggesting that someone else who was selling firecrackers on was at eBay, they would have just said, all right, don't do it again. But because you did that, plus you were speaking out, they're like, you know, some, some prosecutor somewhere looking to make a name said, that's the guy to go after. I, I'm not just suggesting that. I'm saying that openly. While I was in federal prison, the company that I had been buying the firecrackers from was still selling the exact same product with no license and were never prosecuted. So it's, it's not just pure speculation on my point. But, but like my lawyer said, it's like if everyone else was speeding on the freeway, well, they pulled you over. They're going to get you. But uh, don't draw extra attention to yourself if you can avoid it. What did you learn from that time that you were, 10 months, you said? Yeah, um, I think the the biggest lesson I took away from that, and this is very, I think, important in life, not just in prison, but especially in prison, is that just because somebody asks you something nicely doesn't mean that it's not important to them. And so that's very, it's very important, you know, when someone asks you something, even though they ask you very nicely and politely, don't assume that it's not important to them, and, and especially in prison. Yeah, I think it could be adapted. It's very interesting. It could be adapted in a number of ways. Uh, so we talked about the sovereign individual. About 25 years ago, that book was written. And they said, and I think we've both gotten some of this, I fortunately haven't, haven't been to prison in the U.S., but I, they said, if you speak out against the government, if you're helping people find freedom as the government gets increasingly desperate, they're going to come after you. I think that's a suggestion. I say you do everything right, you do everything above board, uh, but it seems to me, I mean, if those are the conditions, you want to be out now, not, well, if it gets a little bit worse, then I'll go. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think maybe that's... Well, people ask me all the time, do you regret renouncing your U.S. citizenship? And I tell them, yeah, I absolutely regret not having done it earlier. I didn't do it sooner, right? Yeah. You know, now I'm 44. I have, you know, substantial net worth now. I first looked into renouncing my citizenship when I was 23. And it would have taken, you know, almost all of my net worth at, the, at that point. Or, uh, and in hindsight, maybe I should have... Maybe not necessarily renounced, but bought that second citizenship so I could have renounced right away when the time came for that. Whereas uh, if, you're, if, there's a fi if, the fire, if the house is already on fire, maybe it's too late to run for the door. And so it's important to have that plan B in place today and not be scrambling when, when the house is already burning down. Uh, this is why I think it's so important to just get to a certain point where you say, oh, even if it's just opening a bank account somewhere, whatever it is that psychologically for you says, now I'm in this. Because once you're going, you and I will get more passports, get more homes, whatever and you realize the investment's worth it. But when you've never invested anything in this, you're just like, well, if this happens. But 10 years ago, you would have said if what's happening now happened, you would have already done it. What are your suggestions for getting yourself motivated? Because I'll tell you, I said last night, I, I mentioned flippantly to my father when I was 14 years old, foreign earned income exclusion, how do I not do that? Oh, maybe I'll renounce my citizenship. <laughs> maybe I should have gotten a second passport at 14 and made it a lot easier. But, but what's your suggestion to get started psychologically? I think psychologically you just have to step out there and do it. And so like, I guess an example of this recently, I went river rafting with a bunch of friends of mine in Japan and they stopped on the side of the river and there's this big cliff and people are you know, cliff jumping into the river. And I'm standing at the edge of the cliff, it's scary to jump, but I figured, okay, well, everyone else did it. This sounds like the fun thing to do, but like once you actually jump, you're going and, and, and you're on your way. And it turned out it was a really fun experience. And I think that's what it's like with second citizenships and internationalizing yourself. It seems scary at first, but the moment you take the jump, wow, what a fun, great experience and a fantastic journey and fantastic memories in the past with more to be had in the future. So take the jump. And I think just as importantly, you're going to, if you, you have to believe in yourself, I'm going to make more money. Like that's, that's been one of my challenges in all honesty is ugh, for, probably for most, most of my life, this is probably the last good year. Like, my talent's going to run out. It's going to be all over. And you think, all right, maybe I won't spend that 100000 because maybe I'll never make a dollar again. But anyone who's accomplished something, you're going to continue to be successful. It's probably better to invest early on, bite the bullet, even when you said, I'm 23. It's going to take a big chunk, but it would have paid off much more in the long run. And it paid off, you know, 100, maybe 1,000, maybe 10,000 times wow. over at this point, right? And, and the, the same is true. I mean, you mentioned it last night as well. 
compounding your interest tax-free so much better than compounding it when you're, you know, paying 30% or whatever the capital gains even tax if, rates Even if it's 5%, yeah. going from 30 to 5 or 40 to 5. Let me talk to you, though, about what's happening in the U.S. And I, I, I imagine you feel politically homeless as well. Maybe you did when you are in the U.S. There's people that I would watch in the U.S., and I'm sure we agree on some things. But when I see, let's say, Tucker Carlson, for example, I feel like there's an increasing feeling in the U.S., maybe in many Western countries, where if you don't toe the line, if you don't believe everything Tucker Carlson says, either a communist or you're a fascist. And there's no room for that. what we do is more nomad capitalists to say there's some nuance here. Let's bring an international perspective. What do you see from what you watch in the U.S. that speaks to that? Yeah, I and mean, people ask me all the time, what do you think of Trump? What do you think of Biden? What do you think of this, that? And I think I'm glad it's not my problem anymore. Yeah. It's not my problem. It's the entire world. It's my home now, and I can go wherever I'm treated best. And that just feels so much happier every day. I don't have to worry about, oh, what did Biden do this day? What's Trump going to do tomorrow? Not my problem anymore. Sure. Right? And if, if Malaysia starts to have problems, I can go next door to Singapore. If Singapore has a problem, I'll go back up to Tokyo. I can go to St. Kitts. I can go to Antigua. I can go, you know, anywhere in the world at this point. It's fantastic. Which means you would do that at any other part of your life, by the way. If you're in a relationship and it's a great relationship for a long time and you love the person, then one day they just start beating you. You shouldn't stay in the relationship. You should go and find. You should f go to the relationship that treats you best. Yeah, and it's so, so relationships can change, countries can change, but they tell you, here's the kind of person we're looking for. But my question, I suppose, is do you still have friends in places like the United States where, to your point, they don't understand and they want to come and say, here's the perspective from Fox News and put that? How do you deal with that? So I, I think. Uh for those that are familiar with Harry Brown, he wrote a wonderful book in, I don't know, maybe late 1990s called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. Yep. And almost everybody's heard of the golden rule, right? Treat others how you want to be treated. But Harry Brown mentioned the silver rule. And the silver rule is just be yourself and you'll attract people who like you for who you are. And that's been such a, 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 a fantastic way to live my life. So I've wound up at this point at 44 years of age. I'm surrounded by people who like me for who I am. And I don't have to pretend, oh, I like Trump or I like Biden or I like this or that. Like, I'm just me. I, I think pretty much politics is all just a big giant scam where they brainwash people into believing that we need some ruling class to rule over us. And people that either can accept me for having that point of view or agree with me, that those are the people that I'm surrounded with and the people that don't like that, well, they, they can live their lives. That's fine. I'm not going to bother them and, and they're not going to bother me at this point because I have a nice passport portfolio from countries that aren't going to bother me. And so it's a And really we'll come back to that in a minute. Great feeling. One of the things we say in our company, I would say in my life is, we need to use the phrase, this is not a fit more. I feel like there's so much weaponization in, in just so many types of relationships. It could be an employee relationship, a dating relationship, a social relationship, where it's who's winning and who's losing. I see more of this in the West, among Westerners. I see less of this in other countries, where somebody would you know, I, I imagine you and I have fewer people that just understand what we're about. And I think a lot of people maybe look at this and they're afraid to be more open because they don't want that smaller group of people. And it's hard for them to say, the people that don't fit, there's no anger, there's no animosity, it's just not a fit. But there, I think there's, there's a fear, don't you think, of this circle's gonna be small. If you're really successful, most people don't understand you. If you're international, people aren't gonna understand you. How do you deal with that? that that's very true, I and mean, the, the more successful you become, the harder it is to have you know, these big friend circles. But at the other side of that too, I would much rather have you know, one or two really deep, close, connected friends than a thousand people I know casually. So for me, the, the deeper connected friends are the, the more important ones. Is that a transition that you made as you became more successful or that's something that you felt all along? I think I became aware of that as I became more successful and as I became you know, more high profile around the world and more successful, more and more people started contacting me every day and it made me value my, my privacy and my personal space quite a bit more. And it made me value the long-term friends that I, I've had that I know, you know they were there for me before I was this you know, international Bitcoin person. Uh, it's nice to have people like that in your life. So let's talk about the passport portfolio. You don't have to mention particular ones. And I really think people necessarily shouldn't. We're going into a, a very multipolar world. Um, people should, should maintain the freedom of a certain uh, privacy when that's allowed. Uh, talk about building a passport portfolio and, and why you want to keep accumulating more citizenships. You have a lot. Why keep accumulating? Yeah, because you never know what the future is going to bring. And if you have the, the net worth and the assets to be able to have more, or you have the family tree history to be able to have more, there's almost no downside. I mean, there's just a few passports in the world you probably don't want. North Korea, maybe Iran, the U.S., and you know, other than that, 
you know, pretty much I'll take what I can get uh, in terms of passports. What about Russia now with, what, with the war? Yeah, I think that, that one I'd be on the edge at this point. I, I think they had a citizenship by investment program until pretty recently. I'm, Golden I'm, visa now. Maybe, and I haven't followed up. I, didn't, I never pulled the trigger on that one specifically. But, uh, oh, they had the three-year if you pay enough taxes. I think they had, of, I, I'd yeah. have to double check, but I think they had one where you paid about 170000 U.S. equivalent. And I think you could even get citizenship out of it at, at one point. Yeah, uh, yes, jobs and pay tax. It was, it, was, it was a little bit of a hybrid, I recall. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. And, and so what about that one? Maybe. I mean, it depends at, at this point. Like the whole world's kind of teamed up against Russia, it seems, at this point. But who knows how long that'll, that'll last, right? And The whole Western world, I suppose. Yeah. And, and, and the whole Western world, though, I kind of feel like on the wrong... I mean, the whole world in general may be in, in large parts on the wrong track, but you don't have to be a part of that, right? You can go wherever you're in your circle of friends that you feel comfortable and, and enjoy and uh and you know cr credit like in st kitts i've met a lot of interesting people on the ground there like there are a lot of interesting yeah. people running around and i have you know invited you and other people to hey come visit st kitts and oftentimes people say people actually go there but like yeah people do go to st kitts it's I just, a beautiful place you have to send one of your jets to come and pick me up because i'm you know going through i recently flew through london and i just felt a little chill like oh, this is really uh this is too much I was in London when the worldwide lockdowns were getting started for the COVID stuff, and it felt like something out of the, what is it, 48 Days Later, or whatever that horror movie was, where like the, and it was really, really bizarre. But uh, St. Kitts did some of the lockdown stuff and this and that, but like, it, it, it didn't feel like you were on the set of a horror movie. It still felt right. like a beautiful Caribbean. Island. I think the definitions between that and, let's say, Australia, I think the, the w difference. same word, different definition. Does there come a time when you're building a passport portfolio when it's just, this is more fun than more diversification? Or do you still think you're still building total diversification and freedom? I, I think it's both. It's fun to, to have a bunch of passports. And I think at some point I'm gonna hit, I think I'll have 10 passports here at some point, right? That's fun, but it's also a safety net, right? Because who knows what's gonna happen in the world. And it's really nice to be able to go to these different places and know that, hey, they're gonna let me in if I show up at the border. And uh, so it, it can be both, right? It's fun and practical. A lot of people who have our viewpoints say the European Union is in bad shape. Many Americans, I guess, would say it's worse than the U.S. I would argue in the EU you have more ways to move around. What is your argument on having or not having an EU passport in that passport portfolio? I think it's a good idea to have an EU passport in that passport portfolio. Maybe in the future it will become a problem for you, but if you have a passport portfolio, if it becomes a problem to be an EU citizen in the future, you can get rid of that EU passport. And so what's the response? I mean, just asking as the devil's advocate, oh, you get them, you get rid of them, you get them, you get rid of them. Someone says, I want to have an identity. What do you tell that person? Your identity is Andrew Henderson. I'm Roger Veer. We have our identities. Your, your passport or your citizenship isn't what gives you your identity. Your identity is you. I think that EU countries are less likely to do what the U.S. has done what Australia is kind of tiptoeing into, what Canadian politicians would like to tiptoe into. I really think that the big English-speaking countries, uh, and I'll exempt Ireland to some extent. I'll even throw in South Africa, because I think that they're obviously going the wrong direction on tax. But I think these, the English-speaking countries are among the worst offenders in many areas, both in terms of wanting to tax their citizens extraterritorially, in terms of some of the, the culture war stuff, what do you say? I, I feel similarly, but I also wonder if that's because you and I are native English speakers, so we just... You see it more. Because, yeah, we see it more and we understand it instantly without any sort of language barrier. And yet, when you fly through Germany, it's a much more pleasant experience than flying through the UK. We have folks here from the UK that's like, I'm, I'm British. I left. I don't, want, I don't even want to fly through it. The same way I wouldn't fly through the US. I, 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 there's something, five eyes, you don't think it's a little more? Yeah, but... Uh... I think we're just much more aware of it. I mean, we had sure. Snowden pointing it out to all of us and, and, and things like that. And so okay. it's hard to know. So I, I you know, the, the UAE has quite a surveillance state uh, as well. And a number of other countries, I'm, I'm sure, do as well. So They're much friendlier when you go there. Oh, they absolutely are. Oh, welcome. How's the weather they, where you're coming from? They couldn't possibly be more friendly in the UAE. So uh, yeah. I, I've really been impressed with the, the friendliness there, too. But, uh, but just because people have a smile doesn't mean necessarily that they're not spying on everything you're doing. So Sure. I think it was a great point that was mentioned last night was you, you know, I think a lot of people who haven't made the move yet are thinking, how am I going to follow and be angry with the politics of my new country? <laughs> like they're, just, they're so used to being angry. Like where's my Sunday shows? Yeah. I, I think just ignore that and move on with your life and spend time with your friends and family and the things that you enjoy. And when you hear people about being angry about whatever political thing, you think, Hey, that's not my problem anymore. 
And it doesn't have to be the problem in your old country or your new country. Yeah. Just, just don't pay attention. I come to Malaysia, contribute to some local causes, but I, that, my extent of involvement is social, and I don't really follow the politics too much. And you're happier not following it, I'm right. sure. I, I feel like it's probably a little bit more harmonious than, than with the way the U.S. is going right now and probably other Western countries, but right. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some people in our circles that the worst thing that could ever happen to them is to become happy. <laughs> like they have nothing else to worry about. Don't you think some? Maybe they would be miserable being happy. They'd yeah. be miserable being happy. Let's talk about uh, you know, your space in, in Bitcoin Cash. What are, what's developing in that space? I know you're working on getting different countries to um, uh, adopt that. Yeah, I'm, as I get older, the more I, I learn to like, especially when it comes to governments and politicians, believe something once it actually has happened already in the past since. Don't believe that it's going to happen until it's actually happened. Um, but the goal still is, you know, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash for the entire world, whether it's Bitcoin Cash or Monero or Zeno or, you know, Dash or take your pick. There's a thousand different currencies out there. And it's really frustrating, though. I feel like there's been a, a big delay in the worldwide adoption of cryptocurrency. And now so many people are using these you know, U.S. dollar-backed stable coins or central bank digital currencies or everyone's talking about them around the world. And I feel like a real opportunity was, was squandered in the potential adoption of Bitcoin itself when the user experience was intentionally made, you know, bad, slow, expensive, and unreliable on Bitcoin. And that'll make some of these Bitcoin maximalists angry that I'll say such a thing. But hey, you know, if the emperor has no clothes, the emperor has no clothes. And it's important, important to point that out. And so we're, you know, maybe five, ten years behind schedule of where we could have been had we not ran into that issue with the, the scaling of Bitcoin for the world. What do you think about FTX? Uh, another disaster for the world there. Yeah, You've seen a lot of them in your I, I have many seen years a lot of this. Them. And, and uh, I guess they keep getting bigger and bigger, it seems, in terms of overall dollar value. But uh, in terms of like what percent of the overall cryptocurrency ecosystem, they're, they're getting smaller. So. Did you know SBF? I, I didn't know him personally, but I, I knew the, the businesses. And unfortunately, you know, everybody that was in crypto got caught up in some way or another in that as well. So it's been a, a frustrating experience. What do you think happens to him next? I don't know. He made a lot of interesting political donations. So we'll, we'll see just uh, how helpful those wind up being for him in the future. And uh, because I'm not directly involved, I haven't followed it super, super closely. But uh, we'll, we'll, the short answer is I don't know, but uh, we'll, we'll find out. So. There's, there's the idea that what we're talking about here, nomad capitalists, go where you're treated best, get second passports, move to other places. Some people say that's a niche. Some people could say that about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. No one's ever going to adopt that entirely. What is your argument on both fronts why this over time becomes less niche? Or does it? It doesn't even have to. It just has to have a big enough community for you to feel at home within that community. So there's another great book I read as a young man called Cryptonomicron. He was talking about these different files like around the world of people that are, have similar interests. And, similar. and I feel like this conference here, Nomad Capital Live, you go out there into the conference hall and you're surrounded by a lot of like-minded, similar people Everyone. you get along with great. And so like there's however many billions of people in the world. I'm never going to meet a billion people. I'm never going to meet a million people. But I meet, you know, a couple hundred people here, or a couple of thousand people here. Wow. Pick, you know, a dozen of those. I have, you know, amazing new potential friends for, for life there. And so just surround yourself by the people that, that have these similar likes and, and interests to yourself. And, uh, and that's all you need. Does that, in your mind, make the case for a place like St. Kitts? What's the pop? Is it 50,000, 60,000 people between St. Kitts and Nevis? Yeah, so supposedly it's like a, around 40,000 in St. 40. Kitts and another 10,000 in Nevis. So. Does that make the case? I mean, if, if, if everyone from Nomad Capitalist went and, and, and all your friends went and got St. Kitts citizenship and we all went there, I mean, you'd have a community and you'd have a country that had these values. Is, is that kind of thing what we're trying to do? We could if, if people want to, but that's the beauty of freedom is people get to do whatever they want so long as they're not hurting somebody else. And so some people have already moved to St. Kitts. And I've met really amazing, wonderful, wonderful people in St. Kitts. But there's other amazing people here in Kuala Lumpur. There's amazing people in Singapore. There's amazing people in Tbilisi. There's people all over the world. So you don't need hundreds of people. You just need a couple of people that you really enjoy and like spending time with. And if you're around those people, life is happy. The, the thought being, Obviously, for me, would rather, rather live in Kuala Lumpur, rather go with you to Tokyo, wherever the case may be, the, for the lifestyle perspective. But that argument always still is, well, most people in fill-in-the-blank country don't necessarily agree. Again, I feel that the West, and maybe, it's, maybe it is because we follow it a bit more, but there's a greater culture of envy that's more and more pervasive. People want socialism. I think in places that had that, they don't want it again. But I suppose the argument is, if the majority of people disagree with you, are you on borrowed time? And maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe we're meant to 
every 10 years goes somewhere new. Well, the way I look at it is we're here on Earth, and people that think like you and I on Earth are outnumbered, right? We're maybe 1% of the population. Uh, we're outnumbered on Earth. Just being a business person, you're outnumbered. Yeah. Just, you know. And, and so just find your little niche within Earth, right? Find your own little Galt's Gulch area and just enjoy that. And don't worry about what people are doing outside of that because you can't control it. And it's focus on the things you can control in life. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Like, I'm sure, you know, probably almost everybody here at the conference, they probably found you through your YouTube videos, I would imagine, or word of mouth, and then they watch your YouTube videos. You and I had never met until a couple of years ago, but watching your YouTube videos, oh, I don't feel alone anymore. Here's a guy on YouTube putting out content that I agree with and I like, and, you know, not every last word, but, like, close enough to where, like, I don't yeah. feel alone in the world anymore. And that's how I heard about Bitcoin for the first time. I was listening to a libertarian radio show called Free Talk Live because I didn't want to feel alone in the world, because going around in day-to-day -day life as you know, business people and free market advocates, it, it can feel really lonely at times, but when you go and connect with these other people that, that think similarly, it suddenly doesn't feel so alone uh, in the world anymore, and that's why it's great to come to conferences like this one as well. So realizing that we're already to an extent alone if you're successful, if you have wealth, if you're creating something, you're, you're already uh, much different than people, so just, just push it just all the way. Just being an entrepreneur, you're already in a you know, very small subset of the world. Right, go all the way you can. Uh, let's go back to the U.S. piece. Uh, you gave up U.S. citizenship. You're a wealthy guy. Uh, we talked about how certainly some people in the U.S. government think people like you and I should never be allowed to go back, but you got a U.S. visa. Talk about that experience and uh, talk about your experience going back and visiting. Yeah, um, going back and visiting hasn't been so pleasant at the actual border control. I, they, so uh, as some people will know and some won't. I was charged with dealing in explosives without a license more than two decades ago now. And so anytime I go into the U.S., I'm flagged in their system. And apparently the border guard has to read all the previous notes about every previous entry to the U.S. And then they have to write additional notes. Because you're flagged or for anyone? Uh, because I'm flagged. So this, this okay. is just extra unpleasant for me. But, I, but I'll tell people, if you're on the edge about renouncing and worried about getting a visa, if I, as a convicted violent felon, can have a 10-year multiple entry visa to the U.S., which I do, I don't think any of you watching this video are going to have a hard time getting a visa. Just don't start a YouTube channel complaining about them and, and, <laughs> because maybe they don't like that, to your earlier point. And that's absolutely true. The, the more you know, outspoken you are about things, the more attention you draw to yourself, the more likely they are to give you a hard time. And so like another example of this, I, I can talk about it now because it's all done and over. There's another YouTube channel that I really enjoyed because I didn't feel alone in the world. Adam Kokesh had a channel. And he would just interview people and talk about different political things from a you know, libertarian type of point of view. And I had donated money to him for, I don't know, maybe five years. I would give him a, you know, a stipend every month. And I was doing it bef you know, before I was, while I was still an American, and I just kept continuing after I wasn't an American. And then at some point, John McAfee and he was uh, his running partner, they were, he ran for not president of the United States on the platform that he would dissolve the entire federal government if he was elected. How serious of a campaign it was it? Not very. Like, he was just doing it to spread these ideas. The United States Federal Election Commission looked into prosecuting me for being a foreigner interfering in American elections because I was donating this guy some money for years. For his podcast, basically. For, yeah, for his podcast. And, oh, what a headache it was. What happened had, with that? I had to spend uh, over $100,000 on lawyers, and it's this revolving door that I hired the former head of the Federal Election Commission to be my lawyer to represent Because it's not me. a corrupt country. Exactly, because there's, there's, it's just so, so much craziness there. And eventually, it was there's, I guess, two Republicans and two Democrats. They deadlock as to whether or not to prosecute me. And when it's a deadlock, the default is not to prosecute. Right. And I was oh, I just barely escaped a criminal prosecution for being a foreigner interfering in American elections. And I was you know, really worried. But another good friend of mine, who I won't say his name, but he said, Roger, no, that's the best possible outcome. I said, how is that the best possible outcome? Right? He said, that means you pissed off the maximum number of them that you possibly could, <laughs> and there's nothing they can do about it. So, so luckily, that's all done and over with. But uh, my other, you know, I've, uh, unfortunately, I have a team of attorneys helping me with things because I've become such a high-profile figure and so much is always going on. But he told me, he said, because you're a high-profile figure and you say these sorts of things, I don't think the government is ever going to leave you alone. That's, what, that's what you learn. Yeah. You know, it's, it, I, I think growing up in my family, you know, with my father who, you know, was some of a public figure and had a business. I mean, I, I learned some of this stuff, but you never entirely learn until you get to each new stage. People really are gunning for you yeah. when you get to this. And, you, you know, even as a young entrepreneur, you're like, I'll just do a better job at, you know, avoiding these things than somebody else. You really don't avoid it, do you? It, this, the moment you become a public figure, you become a public target. And my advice to anybody watching this, like, if you can maintain a low profile, that, that's a a better way to live let, let us do it. Yeah. Just go to Nomad Capitalist and, and .com and get the help, and, and you, don't have to, you don't have to talk about it. Um, 
do you just cut your ties with the U.S. then? Do you just say, I'm not going to give to things in the U.S.? I'm not, like, do you just say, sorry, I'm out? Yeah, at this point, I don't want to invest in any U.S. companies. I, I don't want, basically, I want nothing to do with it. It just feels too dangerous, but I still love my friends and family that I have there. But the U.S. government itself just seems like this dangerous, dangerous thing that I want nothing to do we, with. We, private, we, we do have some U.S. connections, you know, myself and the business, but... Uh, I, you know, even when we look for new charities, it's like, sorry, we don't want U.S. charities. Got to be, got to be outside. And to be honest, like charities in countries outside of the U.S., those people need the money more anyhow. Yeah, right. right. A, a poor person yes. in the U.S. is rich compared to most of the, rest really, of the world. I, I've always, and I, yeah, I've always, always, to our earlier point, always pushed back against. You should help the people around you. I say you should help the people with the maximum need, yeah. and that's probably not where you and I are. And, from. and another, another point also is that a stranger is a stranger is a stranger. Why should I care more about a stranger living in, you know? West Virginia than a stranger living in, you know, Estonia or somewhere else, right? Like, I've never met either of them. Why should I care more I about I think I'd live in Estonia than West Virginia. I probably would, too. Yeah. But uh, but my point is, like, a stranger is a stranger, and it doesn't matter where on earth they are. Last year, you knew uh, John McAfee. I did, yeah. And that's it's been a, a few years since that all went down, but I'm curious to hear uh, your thoughts on the whole situation. He was a guy who was outspoken as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I enjoyed his outspokenness. What a fun, amazing, amazing, amazing person. And... Uh, do I think he killed himself? I think it's pretty unlikely, but uh, you never know. And uh, what do you think happened? Well, if you didn't kill yourself and you wound up dead, I, I don't think he died of old age there either. Somebody put a call in. Maybe, I and mean, it's hard to know. I, I, I think, I think it's unlikely Epstein killed himself either. I know it would be nice to see hard proof, and but look at how many other conspiracy theories turned out to at the moment sounded crazy, and then turned out later on. Totally true, right? So uh, one of my favorite radio shows I used to listen to as a kid was Art Bell. Yeah. And. Uh, I, I was listening to an old archive from like 1999 or something recently, and the guy was talking about the NSA is building stuff to spy on everybody, and they're going to spy oh, on everything. Right, yeah. And at the time, everyone thought, oh, yeah, listen to this crazy guy on the overnight radio show, but turned out he was right about everything. And so who knows what other crazy conspiracy theories are. You know, look at the, the Kennedy assassination. They still haven't released the documents on that. Like, why, right? Clearly there's something there that... Uh, that people would be pretty upset about if they found out what, what happened. Otherwise, they would have released the, the information on that as well. Where do you listen to Art Bell? Uh, I pay for the stream link thing, and you can listen in to it. In 1999? Uh, yeah, I actually, I have it on my phone, so when I'm on oh, the flight. Oh, now you do. Yeah, but no, no, no. I was listening to it a, a couple weeks ago on a flight. No, I, you know, as I'm kind of sleeping, it's my, uh, my sleep medicine is listening to old episodes of Art Bell. And uh, anyhow, it's really a, a wonderful radio show. I, I was sad when he died as well. But, yeah, uh, it's you know, it wild. The, the school of thought... There are some people who say, listen, Andrew and Roger, like, nobody really cares. There's a lot of people complaining about stuff. And there's others who say, yeah, they don't, they don't like it when you complain. Which, which camp are you in? They hate it when you complain. Are you kidding? Well, there's so many people. The argument is there's so many people. You think Joe Biden is sitting around thinking about you? It's like, I don't think it takes Joe Biden sitting around and thinking yeah, about there, you. Yeah, there's plenty of petty bureaucrats out there. I look at, I don't know what percentage of the U.S. population works for, you know, government. It's, all, federal, it's a lot. It's, yeah, exactly. Like it's a one lot. One in five, I think. So there's plenty of petty bureaucrats out there that are ready to cause you. I, I even had trouble with the, uh, the local fire department in Santa Clara, California. I had my business there. Um, there was a robbery. Somebody crashed a car in the middle of the night through the building to come in and they stole more than a million dollars of my, my computer parts there. So afterwards, okay, I need to fortify the building. I installed all these extra locks and, you know, reinforced the door so that even if they crashed a semi-truck into the building the next time, the, the whole building would collapse rather than the, the, the semi-truck being able to come in. And then the fire department comes in. They said, you can't put all these locks on the doors. And they made me undo a bunch of the additional security stuff that I installed on this thing. And it just, oh, it was... It, just such a frustrating thing. And it's a, a, you know, another lawyer of mine told me, he said, if they keep putting glass in your shoes, it's time to go somewhere else. And that's what I eventually did. I, I wound up, you know, leaving the U.S. altogether and uh, it was a good decision. And you think the U.S. has been an isolated incident in countries who do stuff like that? Because a lot of people say, it's not going to be better anywhere else. There'll be nowhere for you to run. I don't know. I, I, I haven't had any sort of problems like that in, in St. Kitts or, or Japan or, or any of the other places I've been. I'm Maybe I'm a bit more uppity in the U.S. because there's no language barrier and, yes. and this and that. And, you know, I'm a foreigner in these other countries. But, uh, you know, so, I must feel so it's easier when there's no language barrier because there's no friction of, like, why don't you understand me? Maybe that's what caused some of the conflicts. I, I, I was telling the fire department people, I said, I literally... Mm. And then on top of that, not all, I should tell another story. I found the more than a million dollars worth of computer parts. A couple weeks later, a company in L.A. called my company and said, hey, we have all these parts we'd like to sell you. We see you're a major dealer in these parts. It's like... Oh, those just happened to be the exact same parts that were stolen. So I called the local police department that took the report, said, hey, I found my parts. Can you go get them? They did nothing. I called the police department in L.A. where the parts physically were. They did nothing. I called the FBI. They did nothing. 
what, no, what does it no, take to get them interested? A million dollars. It was, yeah, it, was, it was closer to two million, actually. And like they did nothing. They did absolutely nothing. But they were Johnny on the spot to like complain that I put too many locks on the doors afterwards. And in California now, you get your car broken into. Just go online, file a report, which almost sounds to me like insurance fraud that like the police just tell you like, just go online, file a report and then get your money back. Who knows if it even happened. Meanwhile, now in New York, they're flying uh, drones over people's Labor Day picnics. Yeah, you can't have a picnic, but that they're on. go for it. So. Right. <laughs> Uh, crazy times we live in. Roger Ver, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. Pleasure to have you again. Thank you so much.